Our gospel lesson for this morning comes to us from the ninth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, verses 33 to 37. Listen to God's word. Then Jesus and his disciples came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about along the way? But they were silent. For on the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. Jesus sat down and called the 12 and said to them, whoever wants to be first must be the last and the servant of them all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, taking it in his arms. He said to them, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This is the word of our God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise that you are a God of love who has made each one of us in your image and called us here as your beloved. By the power of your Holy Spirit, draw near to us and open our eyes and our ears and our hearts and our minds and our spirits that we might draw near to you. May the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts be acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. My parents told me that when I was an infant, they took me to Mass one Sunday, and as the priest ascended into the pulpit, I started to cry. So my mother swept me into her arms and started to walk with that bouncing shh of a new mom and usher me back to the cry room in the back of the church so that the sermon could continue in peace. Now, for better or worse, the priest from the pulpit stopped the sermon and stopped my mother in her tracks and said, don't take her out of here. She is praising God much better than most of us. So my mom, you know, sat back down. I don't know if I kept crying or not. I may cry more today during this service than I did during that one. We're already off to a great start. Now I share that story because I think that it is the priest's words and the reflection that they are on him and his theology that matter. I was just a baby doing what a baby does, but the priest, through his words, encouraged my mother to settle back into her pew, to listen to the sermon as she rocked me in her arms. And he told my parents and everyone else who was there that I, along with every other crying baby, belonged. We belonged in church. We belonged to the community of faith. And most importantly, we belong to God. My belonging did not have anything to do with the decorum of my behavior. Clearly, I was doing what a baby does best. In fact, I could be needy and loud. I could disrupt the whole service and have nothing of substance to offer. And still, I belonged to God. Now, Jesus in the gospel we heard today, offers a similar admonition to his disciples as they settled in after a journey down the road that day. Now Mark will continue to repeat this story in the next chapter as well, saying many of the same words to many of the same people because 
His is a message that is not only worth repeating, but apparently needs to be repeated. Now Jesus pushes the umbrella of welcome even further than Father Nee did in the nave of St. Therese decades ago. Jesus tells his disciples not only that those who welcome a child are welcoming a child of God, but also, in fact, they are welcoming Jesus himself. And what's more, they are welcoming the God who sent him. Jesus equates himself, and dare I say it, equates even God with those little kids with those in society with no agency or authority, with no skill, no money or fame, even no voice. Jesus identifies with the very least among them, those seen in the culture of their day to not even have yet achieved full personhood. Those who can only take and not give, those with no power to call their own, let alone share. Who is the greatest? Jesus' disciples wonder as they bicker among themselves, so Jesus sets the record straight. Who is the greatest? Well, it is not who you expect. It's not the ones who hobnob with the rich and famous or those with the fanciest title or the slickest speech. Rather, it is the one who joins the ranks of the outcast and the powerless, who touches the one in their affliction, who feeds the one who cannot pay for their daily bread, the one who welcomes the child with open arms. And once more, Jesus disrupts the status quo with reversals and surprises. One commentator puts it like this. Imperial politics favors relationships of power and privilege, while the politics embodied here in this text lifts up the lowly, those with no power or privilege. Jesus first calls the disciples to themselves emulate the child, thus renouncing their own social status. He then calls them to welcome the child, to make space for those with no social status, since to do so is to welcome Jesus and to welcome God. According to the story, this commentator continues to say, a child enables God to be known as the one who overturns social hierarchies, welcoming the lowly into God's embrace. The gift of children, thus, is not only about delight and wonder that children embody, but also about the way that children draw followers into resisting the imperial powers of our time, struggling against all that opposes the kingdom of God. Now it is not lost on me that the lectionary reading for my last Sunday as one of the pastors at ELPC is about welcoming children. It has been my distinct honor and privilege to minister to children and youth at ELPC since settling in at P ELPC first as a volunteer and then as a pastor. I believe children are precious. I believe that children are not just the future of the church or of the world, but that they are an integral part of the community we are in the here and the now. I have long believed that it is not only our practical but our theological burden to ensure that church is a safe haven for every child and that we must intentionally create a culture that not only affirms it, this belief but that does everything in our power to make it so. 
For it is through these efforts that we affirm our commitment to our identity as an intergenerational community of faith. And it is through these deeds that we reiterate our promise to partner with Christ in not only caring for, but welcoming the vulnerable among us. Those of you who know me know that it is no secret that I can be a bit of a mama bear. Felicia, who read our epistle lesson, probably knows this really well and could share some stories. Many of you have worked with me to do things like raise the height of the railings in the center stairwell and add balusters so that our stairwell was safe for children. Many of you have worked with me to create and then to continue to edit and implement our child safety policies so that we could ensure that this family of faith could remain a church with doors open wide and remain a safe haven for children of all ages. Many of you have accompanied me as a chaperone on hay rides and retreats and mission trips carrying bins of first aid kits and emergency contact binders and snacks for days. Now, I'm not sure if these acts proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ quite in the same way as did singing songs at Vacation Church School or designing a candlelight worship to, to, for the 30-hour famine youth as I'm, we would sit here on the floor together. I don't know if it proclaimed the gospel as much as it did when we taught the confirmation classes about the doctrine of the Trinity or sat on the steps of this chancel and told the littlest kids in our worship that they belonged to God. But in all of these efforts, I have tried by the grace of God to instill in the children and youth of this church the belief and the awareness that they are above all else, loved, yes, by me and by us at ELPC, but most importantly, loved by God. As my ministry has grown, so has my mama bear impulse. And forgive the Star Trek reference, but I have found the prime directive of my call to ministry to be to bear witness to God's love for us in Jesus Christ and to define us in the most global sense. Us has meant loving those in Christ's name, including those I may not particularly like. Us has meant including others whether others have affirmed our belonging or not. Now I have heard time and time again stories from among us of those moments in life when we have experienced and internalized lies told to us by others about our worth and our ability to be loved. There are lies that have been spoken that undermine our own inherent worth because of race or gender or age or ability or because we love who we love. These lies can come at us through the lips of schoolyard bullies or family members or Facebook memes or even through a church that we entered seeking to learn how to love others better ourselves. But the truth of the gospel is this. You are children of God. You are loved by God who in your weakest and most vulnerable state has picked you up, held you close, and identified most deeply with you. You are children of God. Whether you come to worship in tears, whether you come carrying nothing in your pocket, whether you come with a string of alphabets following your name, suggesting your titles and accomplishments, or all of the above, you are children of God. 
infused with particular gifts and unique sensibilities, yet called to community, for none of us was ever meant to go this road alone. You are children of God, honored, supported, protected, and adorned with care by a God who in Christ has claimed you and called you to be one in his church. You are children of God. It doesn't matter your age or your station or your social location. You are children of God. No more important than another, but equally precious in God's sight. You are children of God, created and redeemed and sustained by God's grace. You are children of God. You are loved. Now it is hard to believe that this is my last Sunday in this pulpit serving as one of your pastors, just as it's hard to believe that many of the same kids who were in my first Sunday school class are nearing the age of 40. It has been a tremendous privilege to have been able to serve among you all. Here come the tears again, sorry folks. It has been a tremendous privilege to be invited into your sacred moments. Not only the ones that have taken place here, but the ones that have played out on soccer fields and graduation stages and wedding receptions and hospital rooms. It has been a privilege to celebrate the milestones of so many seasons of your life and mine. To learn from you and be challenged by you and to strive for justice with you. And to see how each of your particular gifts come together and form a symphonic sound, a chorus of praise to our glorious God. And so I say thank you. Thank you for welcoming me as a young adult, as a seeker who needed a home. Thank you for welcoming me as a newlywed, as a mom, and as your pastor. How am I gonna do the rest of this sermon, folks? Holy moly, let me get a sip of water. I might need to take more selfies to calm myself down. <laughs> And now I can't see through my contacts, okay? I also want to issue a thanks to my colleagues in ministry. As you know, there is a dynamic and vibrant team of pastors and leaders and musicians and facility staff who together work tirelessly so that we can support you in your ministry and I'm glad that at this service, Pastor Patrice and BJ and Dr. Ed are sitting behind me because they were in front of me in Journey, and that's when I lost it. Though I can't look at Will, who's over there. He, um... Thank you for the many ways in which we have partnered together as we have striven to serve our God. I look at Anthony and Gloria. <laughs> all of the people who have been us for so long. I'm doing this now because I'm going to start right. I also want to issue a public word of thanks to my family. It is no secret that pastoral ministry is hard on a family. To my sisters and my nephews and nieces who continually shift the timing of Christmas Eve dinner so that we could be a part of it and still lead to services, and especially to my husband, David, and to our son, Noble, I'll have him watch the video, he's upstairs, for their support and encouragement and love. They have to share me with others at odd times of the day and night, and I am deeply grateful 
for your support and encouragement. Now, as I prepare to embark upon the next chapter of my ministry, I am excited to note that you all are doing the same. We are continuing to journey onward in faith and hope and love together as the universal body of Christ. I will continue to pray for you all particularly but know that part of my prayer is this, that you will recognize the wideness of God's mercy in your own lives, that you will then extend the wideness of God's mercy to others, ever broadening your welcome and embrace to all, that everyone might know that fundamentally they are a beloved, child of God. My prayer is that you will continue to offer special care and a special welcome to those who are most vulnerable, those who are outcast, marginalized, and those who show up seeming to not offer you nothing in return. May you remain rooted and grounded in God's love, remembering always who you are and whose you are, and ever noticing the spark of belovedness in everyone you meet. I pray that the love of God that formed each one of you in the likeness of the divine, that claimed you in your baptism, that has redeemed each one of you by grace, that forgives you and strengthens you, will continue to send you and equip you. I pray that the love of God will be the center of your joy, of your identity, of your hope, and of your call. I said it already, ELPC, I love you. I love you individually, and I love the family of faith you are together. And if there's one thing that I have said that I want you to remember, is that God loves you and always will. Continue on in faith and hope and love knowing that God is with you now and in this next chapter of ministry and in all the stages and twists and turns of life. In fact, God is with you always. May it be so. Amen. <laughs>